Hello. I first wanted to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share our story with the community and importantly for finding a way for us to still come together and talk science. It's from this extraordinary backdrop of a coronavirus pandemic that makes perhaps the most relevant segue to my talk on my lab's discovery of widespread host protein interactions with the pre-replicated viral genome of chikungunya using Virclasp. I think we can all appreciate this fact. Over 75% of the 200 viruses that cause disease in humans contain RNA genomes. And as RNA biologists, we like to say that the history of life on this planet is rooted in an RNA world. It's fair to say that we still live in one. From common viruses like influenza to notorious ones that have dominated the news cycle like Ebola, Zika, and of course COVID-2, there is no question that RNA viruses represent a clear existential threat to our way of life. But as scientists, it also represents an incredible opportunity to understand RNA pathways and mechanisms of both physiologic and pathologic importance. At its most rudimentary, we view RNA viruses as just RNA with packaging, and it is in this perspective that we should recognize that the first intracellular contact that a virus encounters in cytosol is, by definition, with an RNA binding protein. Given that viruses are obligate parasites, it is in these earliest moments of infection when they are the most vulnerable and the most dependent on the cell for resources. To investigate the most early interactions between virus and host RNA binding proteins, we developed VIRCLAS, which stands for Viral Crosslinking and Solid Phase Purification. The basic concept is as follows. We propagate an RNA virus of interest in a producer cell line in the presence of 4-thiouridine, rendering the resulting viral genomes photoreactive. We then isolate the 4-thiou labeled viruses and infect a new field of unlabeled cells under different conditions or times of infection we then use 365 nanometer UV light to rapidly crosslink the incoming 4th IU labeled viral genomes to interacting host and viral proteins. We then lyse the cells under highly stringent protein denaturing conditions. We quantitatively capture total RNA from the lysates, regardless of whether it is cellular or virus, and in so doing, we are able to recover only proteins that remain crosslinked to the captured RNA, which in our case can only be from the 4th IU labeled viral RNA. For this talk, I will focus on our results with the emerging alpha virus chikungunya. One of the first things we did was to ask how long during an infection is the incoming viral genome essential? To answer this, we reasoned that if we were to irradiate viruses either before infection or in the first few hours, we would cause irreversible crosslinks to the primary genome, greatly affecting replication. We predicted that there would be a time point when irradiation would have no effect on downstream viral events, since presumably the incoming genome is no longer required. Here, using viral titer as a readout, we showed that the incoming chikungunya genome is required for only the first three hours of infection, which is concomitant with the detection of viral RNA increase. Based on those results, we performed Virclasp on U2OS cells infected with chikungunya at zero, which was approximately 12 minutes, one hour, and three hours post-infection under conditions in which the host cells were either pre-activated with recombinant beta interferon or not. Shown here is the silver stain of our results. In lanes that were infected with unlabeled chikungunya, the lanes that were labeled with minus 4th IU chik V, we did not find any significant enrichment of any protein. The asterisk represents a band for benzenase, which was used to degrade the RNA prior to loading on the protein gel. As I also mentioned, our approach pulls down total RNA, which is why we could use ribosomal RNA from the cells to visualize the consistency of our recovery. We next subjected the recovered crosslink proteins to HPLC mass spec analysis. Shown here are the top line data from our mass spec runs, including the number of proteins found in our background controls compared to our actual samples, and the correlations of replicate experiments and their similarity to other experimental conditions. The least complex and similar samples, as anticipated, were from the non 4 IU background controls. We also assessed the extent of carryover cellular RNA that was packaged within the virions prior to infecting U2OS cells by RNA-seq. Shown is the table of those results, indicating that we found about 99% of all sequences identified were from ChikV, and only about 1% came from BHK21 cells. This indicates that the 4th IU labeled ChikV virions we used overwhelmingly contain viral RNA. Shown on the left is an upset plot to illustrate the overlap of proteins found either exclusively in naive or interferon activated conditions or shared across different combinations of time points. On the right is an ontology analysis which showed a relatively minor fraction of host proteins identified could be classified as involved in translation, which is surprising given that chikungunya is a plus-hence RNA virus. 
We next want to delve a little deeper on the biology of some of the interactions we found. First, the immunoblasts below the silver stain correspond to the indicated proteins, including tubulin, indicating its lack of enrichment using viriclasp, ELAVL1, which has been previously found to regulate the 3' untranslated regions of alpha viruses, but not shown to directly bind to incoming viral genomes, and DIFIT1, which has been reported to directly bind to viral RNA from vesicular stomatitis virus, but not chick V. We were able to recapitulate those earlier observations. For the remainder of my talk, I will discuss our validation work on IFI-16, fatty acid synthase, and the YTHDF protein family as proteins which we found to directly bind to chicken gunya RNA and their re respective impact on its replication. We observed that YTHDF1 had a more durable interaction starting as early as 12 minutes into the infection and lasting at least 3 hours post. Methyl-6 adenosine modified RNAs are one of the commonest post-transcriptional RNA modifications known. Indeed, RNA viruses were one of the first places where methyl 6 A's were found in the 1970s. Nonetheless, it was not known whether ChickV contains M6A modifications, but given our results, we decided to confirm its presence. We therefore isolated genomic RNA from ChickV virions, fragmented and 5' end labeled the RNA, then immunoprecipitated the RNA using anti-M6A antibodies, or IgG control. The phosphor image shows our results of this experiment and confirms that ChickV does contain M6A modified RNA. A survey of the 11KB genome of ChickV indicates that MAP6A is most concentrated within the first 2,000 nucleotides. The biological impact of the YTHDF proteins depended on the family member. We measured the amount of extracellular viral RNA generated upon knockdown of each YTHDF protein. We also determined the number of infectious particles by measuring viral titer. We found that loss of YTHDF 1 and 3 led to an increase in extracellular viral RNA and up to a 100-fold increase in viral titer with YTHDF1 having a greater effect. On the other hand, loss of YTHDF2 led to a decrease in extracellular viral RNA and a modest drop in viral titer. These effects on viral production were seen as early as minus and plus strand replication. The results of our YTHDF1 experiments are shown in the lower right set of panels. Overexpression of YTHDF1, the blue bars, consistently reduce the amount of minus and plus chick V strands by QRT-PCR. The reverse is seen when it is knocked down, the orange bars, and these knockdown effects can be rescued when exogenous YTHDF1 is provided. Much to our surprise, Viriclass found that IFI-16 can directly bind chick V RNA. IFI-16 is known as a DNA-sensing pattern recognition receptor that can restrict DNA viruses. That said, it has also been reported that IFI-16 can restrict RNA viruses, but only indirectly, as a kind of transcriptional cofactor for type 1 interferon genes. To corroborate our results, we used CLASP as a way of 4 IU labeling and capturing cellular RNA, and found that endogenous IFI-16 quantitatively associated with cellular RNA. We also confirmed this by Parklip, and further found that the interaction remained stable if the captured precipitates are treated with DNAs, but not stable if treated with benzenase or RNase. We found that knockdown of IFI-16 increased minus and plus strand replication, whereas overexpressing IFI-16 reduced the levels of both. The knockdown effects can also be seen as an increase in extracellular viral RNA levels and viral titer. Further, providing exogenous IFI-16 can rescue the knockdown effects of endogenous IFI-16. Importantly, the antiviral effects are independent of IFI-16's previously reported role as an interferon-sensitive transcriptional cofactor, since treatment with actinomycin D or ruxolitinib did not completely abolish the knockdown effects. One of the more interesting finds of the chick interactome were the discovery of quite a few non-canonical RNA binding proteins. One of those was fatty acid synthase, or FASN. FASN was found in a previous screen by Alfredo Castello and others when he was in Matthias Hens's group. To corroborate their work as well as follow up on FASN as one of our VR class hits, we first checked whether fatty acid synthase could bind to cellular RNA using Parklip, which it did. Then we mapped what regions of fatty acid synthase confers RNA binding, which we found within the keto acyl synthase or KS domain, as well as the dehydratase or DH domain we found that knockdown of fatty acid synthase reduced minus and plus strand levels and extracellular viral RNA, as well as the resulting chick V titer. Overexpression of fatty acid synthase led to the opposite outcome. Previous work had shown that inhibiting fatty acid synthase lipid biosynthesis using serulenin reduces chick V replication. To better understand whether FASN binding to viral RNA played an additional proviral role, 
We introduced a nanoluciferase reporter within the chickpea genome as a way of measuring translational output of incoming viral RNA. We then infected cells using viruses containing this reporter under conditions in which FASN was knocked down or when cells were pre-exposed to serulinin. We found its knockdown led to a significant decrease in viral translational output within one hour of infection, which was not observed when enzymatic activity of fatty acid synthase was inhibited by serulinin. Its effects can only be seen starting at three hours. We then set up a rescue experiment where we knocked down endogenous fatty acid synthase and simultaneously overexpressed a wild type or catalytic mutant form. We found that the catalytic dead FASN was as sufficient as wild type in rescuing the translational effects. Interestingly, we found that by the third hour, the catalytic mutant was significantly less able to increase viral translation as wild type fatty acid synthase. In summary, we report the development of VIRCLASP as an approach to capture the very earliest intracellular contacts between RNA viral genomes and host proteins. For this talk, I spoke predominantly about our discovery of the ChickV interactome and our characterization of the distinct proviral roles of fatty acid synthase and YTHDF2 and the antiviral roles of YTHDF1, YTHDF3, and IFI16, considering that we found over 300 other proteins, many of which were time-dependent or interferon-dependent, much work is left to be done. Indeed, when one circles back to the number of RNA viruses that are known and considers emerging infectious pathogens as an inevitability, then having strategies to understand how seemingly disparate viruses may actually target a spectrum of shared host proteins, or that viral tropism is not just restricted to the cell surface, then approaches such as ours will offer us a real opportunity for investigation and discovery. Lastly, I would like to thank the following people, labs, and agencies for their support of our work, especially my postdoc Byungil Kim and graduate student Sarah Arcos who did all the heavy lifting. Finally, I would like to thank you for listening and strongly encourage you to write or tweet us your comments and questions. We are all happy to field your responses and make this as interactive as possible.